This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we support design engineers and make lightning protection easy. You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to the Struck Podcast. This is episode 61 on today's show. We're going to chat about United Airlines making a pretty big push. Um, Obviously, they've been a big player in commercial aviation for a long time, but maybe they're really doubling down with a big order uh, from Boeing and some other endeavors. Uh, We'll talk about a pretty interesting space balloon that (laughs) challenges what this sort of uh, edge of the earth travel could look like. Uh, We'll talk about planes, whether they're flyable again after uh, a water landing or even uh, the cap system deploying on a Cirrus aircraft. If there's any a chance that or ever a chance that they could be flyable again. Lastly, in our EVTOL segment, we'll talk about aviation, volocopter and this tilt rotor from Leonardo, the AW609, which is not an EVTOL exactly, but uh, really interesting and might be coming to fruition soon with certification. So. Alan, how are you, sir? What's the deal with uh, United? Are they trying to be there? I feel like they've always been a tertiary commercial airliner, but it seems like they're <laughs> they're they're done with that image. I mean, is that how you sort of uh, look at them? Well, I th- I think at the moment they're maybe taking the advantage of the market conditions where airlines may ha- well the airlines got infused with some government cash in the United States even though the travel industry is still down, the opportunity to buy airplanes at a lower mm-hmm. price, if you're thinking about inflationary pressure, particularly in the United States and Europe, it may be a good time to buy an airplane. And because uh, Boeing is looking for some cash right now, and Airbus also, you may be, they may have negotiated a really good deal for themselves. Because you never see the published sale prices, the, the, you never see published prices and sales, right? So yeah. y- you always see what the list price is and they always have a disclaimer in any article you read, well, they probably paid a lot less than what the market says the the, the value of the aircraft is, which is fascinating. Every, every airplane sells at a different price. It's it's kind of like cars, but worse, I think. Really? Uh, that's That sounds really surprising. I'm, you wouldn't think that as a consumer. You'd think that this was very... Because of just how how many costs are involved and just how much, I mean, God, to build an airplane, it's such a such a process and so much engineering. You think it'd be much more fixed and rigid than than some <laughs> Yahoo slinging cars on a used <laughs> used lot, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to remember that they have part sales and support sales on the backside, uh, so the they may have signed long term contracts in terms of parts and engineering support going forward so there may be some cash in that mm-hmm. side of it uh, obviously to clear up airplanes off your books right now is a good idea and to get that uh that cash inflow so you may be able to negotiate that a little bit now so there's a lot of market forces at play in here and the business aircraft market has been that way for a long time um the prices tend to fluctuate a good bit based on quantity buys and which is what united is doing right and united's buying roughly 200 Boeing airplanes and about 70 Airbus airplanes. Yeah. That's a pretty good size order. So you can you can throw your weight around a little bit in, in terms of negotiating prices and deals and as particularly long, long-term deals. Yeah, and, and 100, 150 of the 737 MAX 10s, which are, they're a little bit bigger than the MAX 8. Is that correct? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, and they're more like an A321neo. Uh, but the, you know, the 10 is not done yet. Right. So yeah, it's got a, got <laughs> it still has a little, little while left. to go. Right. So if you're, if you're Boeing and, you've, and you're securing orders for that, that, that's a good positive feeling for the rest of the industry. You know, your, your biggest problem, not so much on the 737, but on most airplane models is getting those, uh, initial buys, uh, to show that the market will support it. And if a big airline like United decides to, to tap into that aircraft production and, that just opens it up for a lot of small, smaller airlines to think, okay, there's stability there. If United is buying them, there's stability on that on that product line. They're not going to make a hundred of these and stop stop the production line. I'm going to be stuck with this little bit of an albatross. I'll buy it too, right? So mm-hmm. that that's so there's a lot of 
of unique market forces and marketing that goes on on every aircraft model. And United is lo looking to take advantage of that right now. Well, and so as of 2020, United Airlines was fourth in market share uh, below American, Southwest, and Delta. Right. But does buying fancy new planes really give you a leg up on the competition? Do people care? I mean, I'm not going to book a ticket because it's on a 737 MAX 10, right? I mean, how does this play True. out? I think business drives the United's marketplace in a sense. And I've always thought of United as more of a business uh, person's airline. They do tend to have nicer cabins. Obviously, um, United is ma making a lot of runs to Florida. So, so unlike Southwest, right? So if you get mm -hmm. on a Southwest airline, usually it's, you feel, always feel like you're going to Orlando or Vegas. At some point, that airplane's going there. At, on its route, on its daily route. So uh, you, you kind of get crowded in in Southwest. And if you're not ready to deal with that, you, you really can't get any work done on a Southwest airplane, in my opinion, uh, particularly unless you're sitting in an exit row seat. You just can't move around enough to, to do any real work. Where on a United airplane, particularly in the business class section or first class section, you could totally get some work done in there. And the cabins are nice and it's clean and it's new and it, mm -hmm. it has those all all those touchy feely things. So, um, there is a big, uh, there has been a bigger market for United. I think the problem with United is this, they're based in Chicago and a lot of the U S business community keeps moving further and further South away from them. Right. When more towards Delta, because the weather's yeah, nicer. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. And they're definitely, I mean, they have a big Chicago hub, obviously at O'Hare Yeah, and, um, yeah. Okay. Well, I may, you know, I hadn't really thought about it because I think a lot of travelers, you know, I'm into my 30s now, but in my younger days, you know, you never thought about niceness as a reason you travel when you're, you know, not doing it for business so much. You just think of what's the cheapest ticket within reason. Um, and that's your only concern. But obviously, as you get older and your comfort matters more and business travel matters more, then I think you're right that the jet, you're like, man, that United jet was awesome. And yeah, Southwest feels a little eh, by comparison. Maybe I'll spend the right. extra 50 bucks on a ticket or whatever it is <laughs> yeah. for, for comfort. And I, I do feel that you way will. about American because I had flown only Southwest for a while. And then I was on an American flight and it was, it was just a nicer cabin, clearly newer seats, had an outlet. And just like right. there are enough little perks where it made a difference. And I was like, oh, this is nice. Maybe if I, if I have a choice and it's close, like I'll choose American instead of uh, Southwest. So it makes right. sense. If you if you're doing sales and you're traveling a lot, you don't tend to fly Southwest. You don't see those those kind of salespeople flying Southwest a lot. You tend to see them on an American, a Delta, a United, uh, just because it has a creature comforts and you can be, quote unquote, productive while you're on the airplane. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, press in the news about Jeff Bezos going into the space, Richard Branson going into space, people, <laughs> you know, regular folks who want to pony up a quarter million dollars to go up into space on a rocket. But there's this new uh, company called Space, Perspec space Perspec Perspective. Um, this is an interesting article from Rob Report that this is basically a balloon and they're not going to go out actually into space. They're going to go about 100,000 feet up. But then you just sort of like hang around like you're like a lounge in like a cocktail lounge in the stratosphere and so you actually be you know you'd be able to survey the, the entire planet from 100,000 feet up for a couple yeah. hours which that right. to me seems like a really sensible cool solution because you know the obvious thing is that, well you pay a quarter million dollars to be up and up and back really really fast right you're just flying through space and part, maybe that's part of the, the ride but to be able to survey and have a camera with you and just sort of like have a couple hours up at the stratosphere seems pretty awesome. How do you feel about this idea? I don't know if it would work in in a general public sense, just because of the, the length of time it takes to get up and down. And I'm not sure how they're getting down. I understand the up part. <laughs> so you they just the... pop the balloon. They just, they just take an well, ice pick. Well, that's how most of those balloons work. The bartender work. does it. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's got to have some sort of up-down mechanism to it. Uh, but, you know, like the Felix Bumgardner 
uh, when he jumped out of that little capsule that was at a hundred. Such a cool, like, yeah, such a cool video. I mean, that was back in what the seventies, was it? No, 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 no. That was that was in the that Felix Baumgartner was a was back in the twenty fifteen range, right? He was a, doing that Red Bull thing. They were trying to break the world oh. record on free fall out of a. But the original space. one, okay, different guy. It was a lot, lot older than that. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there had been a guy in, I think, in the '60s or '70s that mm -hmm. had done it, something like that. So this was a, a higher attempt. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I think about being in a balloon that high, I think about uh, that little Red Bull uh, advertising uh, thing they did, where they, you know, Felix jumped out of the out of the capsule and. I think mm -hmm. he broke Mach 1 on the way back down. So. Yeah. so, And I think he also almost passed out on the way back down. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're in a and if you're in a confined space for 12 hours, that gets rough. So it means people could get claustrophobic. You know, people, what do you do? Once you get left off the ground, you're not coming back down. Right. Yeah. So this someone guy, could freak out. <laughs> you know, right. Like an air, airplane just keeps slap. Everyone gets in line to slap that woman. Right. Man, what a classic movie. <laughs> Calm down, bam! Next person. <laughs> it would be like it would be like that, and I'd hate to be stuck with someone who didn't want to be there for twelve hours. Uh, that would that would not be good. Um, and and I also think it's not truly space, right? It's kind of on the edge of space. There's a difference between what mm -hmm. qualifies as space and what doesn't. But it's a cool idea. But the price tag also seemed really high. It was more than a hundred thousand dollars to for a mm -hmm. ticket on this thing. Which would also be very prohibited, to, just because I think the uh, what's the Virgin uh, effort to launch into space with Richard Branson, that one that one may not be super expensive to write on either, and you're kind of getting in that on the edge of space sort of thing from Branson's company. Yeah, it, it <laughs> a lot of these things are interesting, but I think the business model is where you struggle, right? And I think Branson has struggled with his Virgin Virgin Galactic with Virgin yeah. Galactic. A little and they're going to charge a quarter million, and this it says space right. perspective perspective wants to charge 150k for yeah. a ticket. So they might be able to take 12 people up there, something like that. So yeah, but yeah, the, the slowness of it is definitely a factor. You can only be able to make a couple trips each day. I mean, depending on how many aircraft if that's you could you, have, you'd call right. it how many balloons yeah yeah um so the virgin galactic i thought they were talking about two flights a day when they really got rolling which would be profitable for them uh you know because there's a lot of support staff on the virgin galactic setup and it's, it's also virgin's been doing some other things in space they've been launching some some satellites up in there so economics is going to drive all of this So in our engineering segment today, interesting article from AeroTime on the web uh, and just asking the question, can you fix an aircraft that has been landed in the water? <laughs> so obviously these are expensive planes. I know yeah. the question at first just seems like, well, no, but Alan, I mean, when you start to talk about, you know, we, we could take a cell phone and put it in some rice. Can we just put a plane in some rice? <laughs> Can we just dock it in Arizona Try and a out. thing of rice for a while? And um, But, I mean, on a more serious note, if, if there's not major damage, um, I mean, are there any, like, skeletal things? You start to look back at, like, you know, California cars, for example. You know, you, you get a 1960s car from the East Coast. It's rusted everywhere, right? But you get right. a car from... California, Arizona, a dry climate from the 50s, 60s, it's going to have pretty good bones where if you want to restore that, it might even have pretty good sheet metal still because of lack of corrosion. Um, right. And so you could take sort of the skeleton of that car and obviously rebuild it. You know, people do that all the time. So, sure. I mean, is there any chance that parts of a plane could be salvaged, um, you know, even if it's got a little bit of water damage or whatever? I mean, are there any parts that are going to be more impervious than others? It, it depends on the value of the part and... and and uh, how much it's going to take to recover it and restore it. A lot of times, like the used aircraft market and the sort of the scrapped aircraft market, aircraft get put in boneyards because they're no longer useful to the air, airline that's running them. And then the, 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 the boneyard will sell bits and pieces, right? And we've, mm -hmm. I've been involved in some of that because we've, used, we've gone to the boneyard a couple of times to get parts of aircraft for lightning testing, which works out great. Um, you know, they don't have to, they're not flying again, so we can get them at a reduced cost. There's a separate little marketplace where 
uh, aircraft parts get refurbished and put back into the on a active aircraft. Aircraft that have hit the water or have had some sort of major structural damage in a crash don't tend to get back that way. And, and the reason is because if you think about electronic boxes, which may be your most valuable component. So say you've got a flight display, which is a pretty expensive piece or some kind of flight computer, which can be expensive. Once there's involved in a crash, it probably exceeded the, its qualification uh, like G-forces and things like that. So you'd have to take that box and then basically kind of quasi go through it and make sure everything was up to, to snuff and maybe retest it to put it back into a usable market. Um, and the FAA is, is cognizant of that too, right? So the FAA is is on top of aircraft that had crashed, what happened to those parts, and they try to stop a lot of that from happening. Unless, you know, like an aircraft just ages out and then there's still useful parts off of it, that's a, that's a valuable thing. But an aircraft hit in the water typically doesn't go anywhere. The insurance company will write it off and then crush it so it doesn't get back into service or destroy it. Um, kind of like a car, you know, you've, you've seen, uh, cars that have a car fax. You ever look at a car fax for a car in the United States Yeah. Mm -hmm. and see if a car has been flooded. Like, like when we had the floods down in Louisiana, New Orleans, there was a lot of cars that were coming north <laughs> that had been flooded that they're mm -hmm. trying to resell. Right. Cause you could buy them for 50 bucks, take them to up North Massachusetts and try to resell them as yeah. a Southern car with no rust. Well, that thing was under six feet of water, right? Yeah. And so there's you have the same thing exists on the airplane side. We we don't want to resell airplane parts that have been submerged. But isn't that a good example of a situation where like the bones would be intact? I mean, conceivably Could a car be. that's been in a flood where you know the the frame's going to be okay. You know the maybe obviously like the axles will probably have water inside, so the oil is going to be right. sludge, right? And a lot of parts right. like bearings are going to be ruined probably. Right. Um, but like some of it might be OK, but th that's it just doesn't seem like it's worth it for an airplane just to, to get so many people to take out a, a structural piece that maybe didn't have any electronics that could still be valuable. Well, yeah, I think the times I've seen this done is when they have a historic aircraft or like a mm -hmm. World War Two type aircraft. And, and there's just no production pieces around. So you, you want to bring back that airframe if you can. Yeah, you either lose it or or give it a give it a go. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I think that years ago, there was a there's a early Boeing airplane. I think it was a two three seven. I think that was the model number that had. It was like one of the first Boeing airplanes, and was a, a sort of a flying museum sort of piece. And it crashed into the water off the coast of of Washington, and they pulled it out of the water. And I, I think a, a bunch of volunteers went back at it to clean it up and to make it airworthy. I, I believe that aircraft is now airworthy. So at times, it, it does make sense to do that, but it's just these really unique uh, one-off yeah. kind of aircraft, museum-quality pieces that you would do that with. Well, and I guess you couldn't have, I mean, if you heard in the news, oh, you know, a, a, a jet crashes, a commercial airliner crashes, and, oh, yeah, by the way, there used to be some pieces that were from a aircraft that was flooded at one point. You'd be like, mm -hmm. oh, well, why did we do that then? What was the risk reward? You couldn't have just bought a new one. Instead, you know, you lost lives. And yeah, you, hindsight is, it would be pretty cruel in that, you know, pretty cruel judgment on reusing those parts. And there there was, you know, helicopter parts tend to be the most uh, vulnerable because there's not a lot of helicopters around. So there's not a huge aftermarket for old helicopters and getting those parts. And so uh, helicopters are involved in crashes and helicopters that had fallen in the water and that kind of stuff. Those parts are being requalified, quote unquote, put back into service without having the proper records. Or they've taken a military helicopter. It's the same version as a civilian helicopter and trying to use the parts off the military helicopter on a civilian helicopter. There's been a lot of that going on. And the, the end user, the, the person that's responsible for the existing aircraft has to be very careful about that. Uh, so if you get a part if you get obviously, if you get a part in and it's got a serial number that's been abraded off and a new serial number written on it, that kind of stuff you got to be very wary of, right? So you got to you got to know what the value of those parts are, and if you're not, if you're paying like a quarter of that price, you have to think to yourself, is this a real part or is this a part that's airworthy? And, mm -hmm. and the FAA has done a lot in the last twenty years to address that. And so, you know, one of the other ones that's salvageable is well, that's probably not the right term, but 
you know, Cirrus has the cap system, which is their parachute right. system, which has saved a right. number of lives. There's one recently where there was a, a, a sort of a midair crash uh, in I think Colorado, and right. parachute yeah. deployed and saved the the folks on board, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but it sounds like even these parachute deployments after that, the plane is it going to be usable again or not? Toast. Uh, just because the way that Cirrus is built, the the the, the load straps that tie to the parachute are part of the structure. They're built into the fiberglass structure. So when, when the parachute pulls out, it actually rips off the sides of the, the fiberglass on the sides of the fuselage, and those straps pop out. Uh, so the fuselage kind of gets torched when that happens. And then the landing gear is is there is sort of a crushable piece. So the landing gear kind of gets destroyed and shoved up into the, into the frame, and things get distorted. So I have not seen a... Uh, Cirrus aircraft put back into service after that parachute has been deployed. And I think that's true of all those parachute systems. They're not designed to, you know, <laughs> put the aircraft back into service. They're, they're designed to save the occupants and that's it. And let 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 the aircraft become a crushable yeah. uh, piece to, to, to lessen the loads on the occupants, just like in a car. It's very mm -hmm. similar to that. Yeah. So pick one, your life or the your life or the or the the aircraft. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, so it's, there's a couple of things about it, right? So you could you could s slow the aircraft down with having a larger parachute. That's one thing you could do. But then if you have a larger parachute, there's just more weight and more complexity, mm -hmm. right? So you could make the parachute go down slower. Uh, so there's a weight cost benefit trade off versus the number of times it's used versus what is the real goal here, and so that there's a trade off made in the, like in the size of the parachute and knowing that the aircraft aircraft if it lands sort of landing gear down you got this crushable thing and the occupants can mostly walk away all right so in our, our evtol segment today let's first talk about volocopter so they've gotten an yasa production approval but obviously that's not a certification so alan what is a production approval and why does this matter yeah this is this is interesting so they have partnered up or purchased a company that has a production certificate already to make aircraft parts uh, and so there's been some sort of joint partnership that's happened uh, between Volocopter and this other basic composite shop. Yeah, I now, want to say their name. It's D DG Flugzubal, I think, <laughs> right. German company. So yeah. I did my best, and I think I did a good job. Anyway, yeah, go it's pretty good. Yep. So the the production certificate is basically an allowance by EASA, and, and the FAA has a similar system where. Uh, you can handle the production um, quality management of so the parts and the flows and that kind of thing uh, internally. It's like having a, an ODA uh, on the engineering side. So on the engineering side, the FAA can say you have set up a system internally for doing handling engineering and approving all the data needed to show compliance. So you have this internal organization, the FAA just audits it. Same thing happens on the production side, where you have an organization and a bunch of people and a system to monitor the quality of the parts that go out the door. And the FAA is saying, okay, you guys can handle that internally. We're going to audit you and check on your books, but we're not going to have to stamp on every, stamp off on every part that goes down the production line. So like, I'll, I'll give you an example. So on a, on a, on a new aircraft, uh, uh, say it's a Learjet, since Learjet's no longer around. So say Learjet wanted to make a Lear 100, whatever that would be. So they could do all the engineering work and show that it's certified, but that wouldn't necessarily mean they could produce it without having, out, without having the FAA on top of it and stamping off, FAA people stamping off on every part of the process as the aircraft moved down the production line. That just adds a layer of bureaucracy to it that if you can create a, a system, a quality system, uh, you can eliminate that sort of top level bureaucracy and all the stamps and paperwork stuff that has to happen, and you can deliver your aircraft in your own production mm, system. Okay. So th that's what it means. It just means that you're taking on the responsibility of the certification authority, but the certification authority is still auditing you and making sure you're doing what you say you're doing. So you're not you're not relieved of any requirements. You're just saying that you got a system in place that meets the EASA or FAA requirements. That's it. Okay, so kind of like here in the U.S., uh, if you need FDA, um, you know, approval for like uh, you know, slaughtering your cattle, right, or whatever. Yep. yep. Um, 
you could build your own FDA approved facility, which would be costly and expensive. You have to do it all yourself, or you could just take your cattle to the local processing plant that's already FDA approved, and then they could just get it done. You know, yeah. it's going to be done right. But right. That kind of right. Right. Because it, there's a lot of intricacies in building parts and the quality system to build parts. It's not. Yeah. And you could be certified. Not, your design's great. But then if you build your parts like trash, I mean, your, your plane's not going to work very well. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't so matter, the execution right? part matters a lot, obviously. Right. The execution matters a lot. And you'd be surprised at the level of rigor uh, that goes into that. And I, I always am because I'm, I'm around it. But, you know, if you look at how a car is produced versus how an airplane is produced or how a spacecraft is produced, which is, I guess, has even higher oversight. Uh, there are just levels of gradation there where a car doesn't have a lot of oversight. The employees mm -hmm. that are putting the parts on kind of put parts on and it moves down the line. There's quality in the system, but there's a lot more oversight on building an airplane. And there's a lot more paperwork involved with it to track parts. So if you, ha I'll give you a good example. So if you had a, a um, bad lot of parts, so they got uh, some metal parts got heat treated wrong. Do you know what those parts are? Well, on an airplane, you do. I mean, you go back, look at all the records, find out what that stuff is, and go f replace all those improperly heat-treated parts. On a car, it gets a little more murky because they don't necessarily track it like that all the time. Mm -hmm. But on an airplane, they do. So there's just a lot more uh, of knowing what the configuration of every aircraft is. And like every aircraft that comes down the line is slightly different. I know that's hard to think about because cars don't tend to be that way. But every aircraft coming down the production line has, particularly in the interiors, has some uniqueness to it. Even if it's just in the paint job, it's going to be unique. Um, the, the options you've chosen, there's a lot of things you can choose on an airplane. So if you're a production facility and every airplane is different, you've got a lot of work to do to make sure that that airplane actually meets what's actually in the engineering drawings, that what's meets the, meets the FAA regulations in terms of uh, production uh, quality parts. It's, it does take a lot of experienced people and to mm -hmm. do that. And when you run across someone who has done it for a while, you almost impressed because it's such a wide breadth of knowledge you have to have to be yeah. in that production system. So moving on here, uh, Aviation has revealed their all electric uh, production model of the uh, Alice they're um you know pretty interesting aircraft that's going to have potentially nine passengers uh, no carbon emissions you know really low noise right. um alan why is this significant because we know we've known about the the aviation alice for a while we talked mm -hmm. about it you know a number of months ago yeah but this is the production version so what's the difference between this and, and their their initial prototype well if you remember the prototype the 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 motors electric motors were out on the ends of the wingtips and the propellers were out on the ends of the wingtips that's where thrust was, right? And what they've done now is they move them into a pylon position on the fuselage, much more like a, a jet. It's like a typical, typical jet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Business jet kind of situation, but they're propellers instead of jets, right? Uh, so it's a much more normal configuration for aircraft. Uh, the couple pieces about uh, aviation's approach is one, it's carrying nine passengers or nine people. That's a lot, right? Compared to Joby, uh, Archer, or some of the other ones, which are going for like a two, three, four, five kind of number in terms of passengers. Also that they're not relying upon improved battery technology to, to get the range that they will want. So it's what the press is saying now is that all the range numbers and all the carrying the passengers and load capability are all built in it today. I don't have to wait five years and the aircraft's going to improve every single year. They've got a baseline design that does essentially kind of what a King Air does now, not in terms of range, but in terms of performance, it's sort of there. And it, it, it kind of reminds you of a, a King Air type aircraft, which is the same thing that by aerospace is going after uh, with their uh, eight passenger airplane. There's a unique marketplace which would be in this uh, King Airish uh, business aircraft market, which is low operating costs. You're not going for a five hour flight. You're going for like a two hour flight. So you're going from uh, Kansas City to Chicago, sort of thing, to conduct business and come back that night. That, that's sort of the marketplace mm -hmm. for that aircraft. Yeah, the commuter. Um, yep. 
Right, but I think the the, the point is that the the operating costs are a lot lower. Uh, even though a King Air has a PT6 uh, turboprop air engine in it, and which is one of the most uh, uh, durable, longest production run engine, and has just millions of hours of great service with it, it does. It is still a uh, jet type engine, so that mm-hmm. it does have parts that you know, wear out and they're expensive to replace, da 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 versus an electric motor, which is a lot simpler. So I, I think that's when it gets on the sort of the, the day-to-day operational costs that electric may be the way to go. Now, how you got to wonder, Dan, how 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 soon they're going to be able to do this. Right? That, that's the key is how fast can you create and certify something? Well, I mean, it looks a lot more, like you said, it, it looks like it's sort of conformed to typical design like sure. you said it just looks like a sort of interesting looking typical kind of business jet which yep. i mean as you've mentioned many times that's going to get it closer where well, there's just less fewer unknowns right to certification right. so obviously right. it's still electric there's still a lot that's new about it but it seems like this is a pretty reasonable endeavor that they're undertaking to get this like pretty reasonable plane to market right as compared to some of these yes. wacky and of course this is not an evtol but Right. Some of these wacky designs that seem like, ooh, yeah, good luck with that. This seems like, okay, well, you know, right. it could just take yeah, a little yeah, time, but it could get there. That's right. And, and if you can imagine one of your largest expenses to certification is working with the FAA and getting through all the regulations. And so if you can knock the number of quote unquote controversial or difficult regulations down based on your aircraft design, it's just going to get you to making money faster. That's a good thing, right? So you're going to see these compromises. There are some unique things about this Alice aircraft, no doubt, right? But but for the most part, a lot of the they're checking a lot of boxes on compliance based on the way this this aircraft is constructed and its layout. That gets them to selling aircraft faster, which gets into uh, you know paying off the loans and the investors money. and the whole thing, because mm-hmm. there is a business behind this and everything. All this technology is cool, but there is a business behind it, and people expect to get paid. So last on the docket today is the AW609, which is a tilt rotor from Leonardo, which the concept's been around for quite a while now. Uh, but there's some recent buzz about this that it's expected to start flying soon and that it might actually make it to certification, you know, uh, not in a month or two, but in the relative near future. Um, Alan, what's what's the story with the AW609? Why is it taking so long? And, and this tilt rotor design, which seems pretty cool. Um, why has it been so hard to get out into commercial service? Well, I, there's a couple of things about the aircraft. It's sort of a business size derivative of the V-22, mm-hmm. right? So it kind of started off as a Bell project and has bounced around a little bit over time. Uh, but the the marketplace for it is really on offshore oil rigs, oil and gas, right? Uh, because right now they're using helicopters to go from onshore to the to the uh, oil rigs out in, in the Gulf of Mexico, North Sea, wherever. Uh, and that helicopter th- um, is not the fastest way to get back and forth. Then there's just a lot of <laughs> there's just a lot of stuff about a helicopter which is not as advantageous as having a tilt rotor. And uh, the 609 has has got a lot of cool features in it, but it's also a complex thing uh because it has basically two two engines one on each wingtip and the whole and the cell kind of moves up and down to go from vertical flight to forward forward flight uh, but from a operational side if it loses one engine then the other engine has to take over and drive both propellers right so it's got this transmission that runs through the middle of it the same thing as a v22 uh so there's complexity to it and the flight controls are unique because it has different flight control properties. You're going forward flight, you got things, propellers moving, tilting up and down, the whole thing. There's just complexity to it. And it costs a lot of money to develop an aircraft. And the, the marketplace is, although solid, because you're, you're dealing with customers that are, that are in the oil and gas business, which have cash and can buy them. But at the same time, there's not they're not going to sell thousands of these things in, the, in a year. Uh, so economically, you kind of have to 
balance off what the potential marketplace is versus the cash burn you're in mm-hmm. and balance it out, which is, I think, one of the reasons why it's sort of taken so long is that it's sort of a, it's a, it is a complicated, unique for the FAA. It's a unique aircraft, but also the economics sort of force you into this sort of longer term, be careful approach uh, with the aircraft. So hopefully it gets done because it's going to be manufactured down in Philadelphia. That's awesome. Uh, and I, I think there is a definite marketplace for it, and it, there is a need for it. And you're going to see customers start to line up for it the closer and closer they get to certification, which is what Leonardo wants. So it's it just going to take a little bit of time. In my, in my opinion, is this, this, that project is going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And well, will it run into the eVTOL market that's, that's ramping up at the same time? Because ideally, the 609 gets done two, three, four years ahead of the real EV tall market, and they've they created a market space for themselves, which is great. Well, they are looking at 20 to 30 million per plane. Mm-hmm. Is that yep. pretty standard for a business jet? Is that outside that realm? Obviously, I think the EVTOL market's going to try to come in a lot cheaper than that. But right. Um, I mean, is 20 to 30 million cost prohibitive for this sort of commuter, you know, not CEO not for, lift off, take off well, go to oil no, rigs kind of thing. I, I don't, I don't think the CEO is going to be buying this thing so much. It, well, it depends on the specifics of what the, the, the business needs, but, uh, in terms of getting people back and forth to oil rigs and, uh, making those difficult flights and, and f- flying faster and higher altitude, I think also, um, and more probably more reliable, right? That uh, there is a benefit to it, right? So, and that's why I'm saying that the marketplace really drives this. So, the cost is a lot more than buying like a Cessna Citation, mm-hmm. it just is, right? And, and uh, but the marketplace can support it. And if they want that operational capability, you don't have to pay for it. That's just the way that it is, right? So, it is um, a very unique aircraft for a very small segment of the aerospace marketplace but there is money to be had there there definitely is all right well that'll do it for today's episode of struck if you're new to the show thank you so much for listening and please leave a review and subscribe on itunes spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts check out the weather guard lightning tech youtube channel for video episodes full interviews and short clips from the show And follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our handle is at WG Lightning. Tune in next Tuesday for another great episode on aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.